Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Greedy Businessmen Marty the Martian by Arnold Marmer Reaching for the Moon by S. A. Lombino Man of Distinction by Michael Shara Firth's World by Irving Cox, Jr. The Show Must Go On by Henry Slezar Marty the Martian by Arnold Marmer Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, August 1954 Narrated by Tom Trissel it's still very clear in my mind. The whole episode, the afternoon visit to Marson's office, the trip to Mars, and the journey back. It was one of those warm summer afternoons. All one craved for was a patch of green grass to recline on, and maybe a faint breeze to tingle one's forehead. I was sure of the grass and hopeful for the breeze. But one of Marston's messengers popped up, and the grass and the breeze would have to wait. After all, Marston was my boss. He had his office in the Empire State Building. Norbert Marston was the owner of the Marston Circus, the greatest, biggest, loudest circus in the world. And if you don't believe it, ask Mr. Marston. Sit down, Nick, he invited, speaking from one corner of his mouth as the other corner was busy chewing a dollar cigar. Marston was a small man with sleek black hair, a small man with big ideas. I sat down. Nick, you're the best bring em back alive man I've got, the best. This was very true. You've got a good job for me, I said. That's correct. So why the build-up? Tell me what you want. I want something that no other circus has. You must be kidding. You have every known animal there is. Why, the bushmaster I brought you two months ago is the longest. It isn't exactly an animal I want. Oh? You mean you want a performer? What the hell have I got to do with? What I want is out of this world. A different kind of act? I still say. I want a Martian. I was glad I didn't have a mirror in front of my face. I could imagine how foolish I looked with my mouth hanging open. I even have a name picked out for him, Marston persisted. Marty, the Martian. What do you think of that? I stood up slowly. Let me know when you've recovered. Marston came round the desk. Sit down. Now listen to me. Did you ever hear of a man named Hendrik Ritter? No. The greatest scientist in the world. He's been working for me for over a year. I hired him to do one particular job for me, to concoct a fuel that will get a spaceship to Mars and back. Well, it's done. Did you ever hear of a man named Sam Young? Same answer as before. He's a designer for airships, the best in the business. He's finished a job for me. And, Nick, it's already built, and I've got Joe Roan working for me. I've heard of him, I said. The greatest pilot in the world, Marston said. The greatest this, the greatest that, and for what? Why, the ship probably won't get off the ground. Marston chewed furiously on his cigar. But what if it does get off the ground? What if it does get to Mars? All right, so what? How do you know there's life on Mars? There is. I hired the greatest... Oh no, I groaned. I believe you, I believe you. So now we're on Mars. You capture a Martian and bring him back. What if he doesn't care to be captured? What do I pay you for? I thought this out, then said, To capture Martians. Exactly. You wouldn't settle for a moon maiden, would you? I've heard they're cute and sexy. A Martian 
He was very adamant. I'll have the greatest attraction in the world, Nick. I'm the kind who gets what he wants. I've spent over three million dollars on this project, and I'm ready to spend another three million. Just get me my Martian, and you'll be a rich man. You'll be rich enough to quit working for me and to tell me to go to hell. You'd like that, wouldn't you? I'd like that very much. Two weeks later, we went to Arizona. A week after that, we took off. I didn't really think we would, but we did. Just me and Joe Roan, two men in a spaceship. A huge metal tube hurtling through the longest and blackest of nights. Joe Roan was a good-looking chap. Good-looking, young and excited. He was the first to pilot a ship to Mars. He was looking ahead to the glory that awaited him. We landed on Mars. We put on helmets that Ritter and Young had made for us. We stepped down the metal ladder. They were there, waiting for us. I'd rather have faced a bushmaster or a rhino. They stood on three legs. They had globe bellies, tiny heads and no necks. They were of a colour I'd never seen before. They had two arms with two hands attached to each arm. I suppose they were hands. They were more like claws. I stood frozen solid. Joe Roan screamed and turned to run back up the ladder. A beam flashed, and Joe fell forward, silent and very dead. After that, it was all a blank. When I came to, I was strapped down by metal clasps on a long board made of some kind of marble. I was alone for some time. I don't remember how long it was before one of them appeared. He stood by my side, looking down at me. His eyes were purple. There were no whites. You have come a long way, he said. You you speak English? We used a 64V machine on you. We learned your language, your thoughts, your name. We know about Norbert Marston. A very enterprising man, it seems. W what are you going to do with me? We haven't decided yet. So you are going to take one of us back with you for Marston's Circus, to ex exhibit one of us for to your stupid race. My followers wanted to kill you when this information was learned, but I believe I have a better idea. He went away. I yelled for him to come back. I yelled till my throat was dry. Eventually, he did come back. He came back with Joe Roan and myself. I want you to meet Clar and Grat, he said. They have taken over your bodies. You will take theirs and return to Marston. We have a transformer machine to accomplish this only we never had an opportunity to use it until you were so gracious as to visit us. He spoke on, telling me of his idea. I shuddered and wished for death. I begged him to kill me. Then a contraption was fitted over me, and it hummed, and I passed out. I remember the trip back to Earth. I'm no longer Nick Faber. I'm Marty the Martian. What a cute title Marston has hung on me. I've got a nice home, and I get plenty to eat. Only my home is a cage, and it's made of glass. People come from all over the world just to see me, and Marston has been to see me every day. He chews on his big cigar, and there's a smile on his face a yard wide. I tried to talk to my keepers, but all I can manage is some crazy kind of gibberish. I also see Clara and Grat, but they're only there when Marston is around. They're keeping very close to him. My being transformed into a Martian was just part of it. Clara and Grat were going to carry out the rest of it. On one dark night, and very soon, Clara, Grat and Marston were going to disappear. Maybe I was the greatest attraction on earth. 
but Norbert Marston was going to be the greatest attraction on Mars. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Reaching for the Moon by S. A. Lombino Originally published in Science Fiction Quarterly, November 1951 Narrated by Tom Tudor It was no longer a question of theory, but of money. Man could reach the moon, if Saunders could persuade someone to finance him. The laboratory was brightly lit, and four men in business suits surrounded the large table. They stared down at the blueprints on the table, some scratching their heads, others rubbing their chins in speculation. The thin man, in grey tweeds, eyed them cautiously, his breath coming in short, anxious rushes. The big man at the head of the table adjusted his eyeglasses, his hand lingering on the rim for a second. Then he cleared his throat and said, "'It won't work, Dr. Saunders.' The little man in grey tweeds darted impatient eyes at the man who had just spoken. "'Why won't it work? Why not?' "'It can't be done,' the big man stated simply. "'Maybe sometime in the future, but certainly not now.' Saunders stretched a bony hand out from the cuff of his tweeds. "'It can be done,' he said, slapping that hand on the table. "'It's all here. You've just seen it. You've studied it. Damn it, this isn't a fly-by-night affair. I worked on these plans for more than eight years. I know it will work.' A man in blue serge shrugged and said, "'I'm afraid Bragg is right, Dr. Saunders.' He tugged at his collar, the fat hanging in loose folds around his neck. Saunders turned to eye the newcomer. "'You agree?' he asked defiantly. Even after studying my work, you agree that my proposed rocket couldn't possibly reach the moon? It might, the man in blue serge admitted, but we can't speculate on a thing of this nature. After all, Dr. Saunders, there'll be money involved, and— Money, Saunders snorted in disgust. Is that all you're worried about? You're one of the richest men of earth, Mr. Peterson. How can you let money stand in the way of what may well be man's greatest achievement? Bragg spoke again, peering from behind the thick lenses of his eyeglasses. Peterson is right. This thing would cost millions, more than any of us would be willing to risk. We appreciate your considering us, but— Saunders cut in sharply. Did that go for all of you? Is Mr. Bragg speaking for all of you? A heavy silence crowded into the room. Saunders confronted Peterson again. "'He speaks for me,' Peterson said. "'And you, Mr. Thorpe?' Saunders asked. "'Yes, yes, I'm inclined to agree,' a balding man in Glen Plaid announced. "'Mr. Slade!' Saunders turned to a weasel-like man dressed in solemn black. Slade nodded, his face chalky white against the black of his garb. "'I've asked you four men because you were probably the richest men on earth. I've asked you because I thought perhaps you would see the significance of such a project.' "'To reach the moon!' Saunders' eyes gleamed with intense light. "'To reach the moon!' "'And when we reach it?' Peterson asked. "'Then what?' "'Unlimited space!' Saunders answered with feeling. "'New worlds! Worlds beyond the imagination of man! "'The moon is only the first step, the experimental step. "'From there, Mars, or Venus, or a new solar system!' Bragg said, "'Rubbish. Even if this should work, I'm not at all convinced it will, but even if it should, what's on the moon for us? Bare crags and lonely craters, cold, bleak atmosphere, nothing.' "'Nothing that would bring in money, true,' Saunders said. "'But look at Copernicus and Galileo. Look at Pasteur and Edison and Curie. Look at—oh, I could get on all night—' What these men contributed to mankind can never be measured in terms of gold or silver. Can't you see that? Who wants to go to the moon anyway? Thorpe asked, passing a hand over his bald head. We've got troubles of our own right here on earth. Plenty to settle right here, man. Plenty. In a little while, perhaps. Sometime in the future. Twenty, twenty-five years. But now, unthinkable. We've been saying that too long, Saunders snapped. 
Now is the time, not twenty or twenty-five years from now, but right now. Science has given us the means. It's up to us to take the opportunity and use it. It couldn't be done profitably, Peterson said dryly. Profitably, Saunders said bitterly. Are your wars profitable? he suddenly shouted, bringing his bony fist crashing to the tabletop. Let's not get violent, Slade said. It was the first thing he'd said all night. Saunders somehow had the feeling that a corpse had spoken. Exactly, he said. Let's not get violent. Let's spend some of the money that's been buying munitions and lives. Instead of raising cities to the ground, let's go up into the skies. Let's spend that money for a project that's worth while. For once, forget the profit and think of the meaning to mankind. He paused and his voice grew lower. We've been ravaged by too many wars, gentlemen. Can't we stop this useless butchery and devote our time and energy to something constructive? Can't we? I know my rocket will work. It's scientifically sound. I know, too, that I can get a crew of scientists and technicians to take it to the moon and back. All I need is the money and a little time. Just a little time. There's a war going on, Saunders, Bragg reminded him. He had lit a cigar with a gold lighter and was sitting now, puffing leisurely, blowing smoke at the ceiling. "'I know,' Saunders said. Two wars in the past thirty years, and now another one. But consider this a moment. A trip to the moon would probably end all hostilities on Earth. It would probably unify this planet as no other force has ever done. It will galvanise humanity into constructive action. It will open new vistas that cannot possibly admit plans for war.' Peterson yawned openly. Hmm, I must say you're an idealist, Saunders. I doubt very much if anything short of a trip to the sun would unify the people of Earth. He chuckled a little at this, and looked to the others for approval. That's right, Bragg agreed. There'll always be wars, Saunders. The Earth is overpopulated. Always will be. More reason to find new worlds, Saunders said tiredly. The only solution is war, Bragg insisted. Survival of the fittest. Forget your crazy ideas about new worlds. There's plenty of room right here. For the people who win. And suppose we lose this time? Saunders asked. We'll never lose, Bragg said with certainty. Slade smiled a thin, wry smile. Exactly, Bragg, he said. As for me, whenever people are ready to fight, I'll be ready to supply them with the goods they'll need. In the meantime, the moon can wait. A year, maybe two, Saunders pleaded, and the universe will be open to us. Think of it! Think of it! Again his eyes lit with intense ardour. You think of it, Bragg said. I'm going home. The other men nodded and began bustling into their overcoats. Saunders stood by helplessly, feeling his last ounce of strength seep from his body. "'Nice of you to think of us,' Thorpe said cheerily. "'Business is business, though.' "'Yes,' Saunders said quietly. "'If you can figure a way to put a warhead on that rocket of yours,' Slade suggested. "'Not a bad idea,' Bragg admitted. "'Well, Saunders,' Peterson said, "'we've got to be running.' No hard feelings, of course. In fact, I wish you lots of luck. He chuckled again and opened the door. Good night. The rest of the men filed out after him, nodding their farewells. Saunders watched them through the window of his laboratory, watched chauffeurs open the doors of long limousines, watched tail lights disappear into the blackness of the night, little red pinpoints emphasising his failure. He walked back to the table and sat cradling his head in his arms, leaning on the blueprints of his ship. All I needed was money, he thought, money and a little time, a year or two at the most, a year or two. Slowly he rose and brushed a thin hand over his wet eyes. There was work to be done, and tomorrow was another day. He walked to the door leading to his inner laboratory and paused. It was past midnight, and being a punctilious person, Saunders ripped the day's page from the calendar, exposing the new day to view. The new day was September 21st, the year 3951. 
he snapped off the lights and stepped quickly into the other room. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Man of Distinction by Michael Shara Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, October 1956 Narrated by Tom Trussell The remarkable distinction of Thatcher Blit did not come to the attention of a bemused world until the late in the year 2180. Although Thatcher Blit was, by the standards of his time, an extremely successful man financially, this was not considered real distinction. Unfortunately for Blit, it never has been. The history books do not record the names of the most successful merchants of the past unless they happen by chance to have been connected with famous men of the time. Thus Croesus is remembered largely for his contributions to famous Romans and successful armies, and Haim Solomon, a similarly wealthy man, would have been long forgotten had he not also been a financial mainstay of the American Revolution and consorted with famous, if impoverished, statesmen. So if Thatcher Blit was distinct among men, this distinction was not immediately apparent. He was a small, gaunt, fragile man, who had the kind of face and bearing that are perfect for movie crowd scenes, absolutely forgettable. Yet Thatcher Blit was one of the foremost businessmen of his time for he was president and founder of that noble institution, Genealogy Incorporated. Thatcher Blit was not yet twenty-five when he made the discovery which was to make him among the richest men of his time. His discovery was, like all great ones, obvious yet profound. He observed that every person had a father. Carrying on with this thought, it followed inevitably that every father had a father, and so on. In fact, thought Blit, when you considered the matter that rightly, everyone alive was a direct descendant of untold numbers of fathers, down through the ages, all descending one after another, father to son. And so backward, unquestionably, into the unrecognisable and perhaps simian fathers of the past. This thought on the face of it not particularly profound, struck young Blit like a blow. He saw that since each man had a father, and so on and so on, it ought to be possible to construct the genealogy of every person now alive. In short, it should be possible to trace your family back, father by father, to the beginning of time. And of course it was, for that was the era of the time scanner. And with a time scanner, it would be possible to document your family tree with perfect accuracy. You could find out exactly from whom you had sprung. And so Thatcher Blit made his fortune. He saw clearly, at the beginning, what most of us see only now, and he patented it. He was aware not only of the deep-rooted sense of snobbishness that exists in many people, but also of the simple yet profound force of curiosity. Who exactly, one says to oneself, was my forty times great-great-grandfather? A Roman legionary? A Viking? A pyramid builder? One of Xenophon's ten thousand? Or was he perhaps, for it is always possible, Alexander the Great? Thatcher Blit had a product to sell and sell he did, for other reasons that he alone had noted at the beginning. The races of mankind have twisted and turned with incredible complexity over the years. The numbers of people have been enormous. With thirty thousand years in which to work, it was impossible that there was not, somewhere along the line, a famous ancestor for everybody. A minor king would often suffice, or even a general in some forgotten army, and if these direct ancestors were not enough, it was fairly simple to establish close blood kinship with famous men. The bloodlines of man, you see, begin with a very few people. 
in all of ancient Greece in the time of Pericles, there are only a few thousand families. Seeing all this, Thatcher Blit became a busy man. It was necessary not only to patent his idea, but to produce the enormous capital needed to found a large organization. The cost of the time scanner was at first prohibitive, but gradually that obstacle was overcome, only for Thatcher to find that the government for many years prevented him from using it. Yet Blit was indomitable, and eventually, after years of heart-rending waiting, Genealogy Incorporated began operations. It was a tremendous success. Within months, the very name of the company and its taught slogan, an ancestor for everybody, became household words. There was but one immediate drawback. It soon became apparent that, without going back very far into the past, it was sometimes impossible to tell who was really the next father in line. The mothers were certain, but the fathers were something else again. This was a ponderable point. But Blit refused to be discouraged. He set various electronic engineers to work on the impasse, and a solution was found. An ingenious device which tested blood electronically through the scanner, based on the different sine waves of the blood groups, saved the day. That invention was the last push Genealogy Incorporated was ever to need. It rolled on to become one of the richest and for a long while most exclusive corporations in the world. Yet it was still many years before Thatcher Blit himself had time to rest. There were patent infringements to be fought, new developments in the labs to be watched, new ways to be found to make the long and arduous task of father tracing easier and more economical. Hence he was well past sixty when he at last had time to begin considering himself. He had become by this time a moderately offensive man, surrounded as he had been all these years by pomp and luxury, by impressive names and extraordinary family trees. He had succumbed at last. He became unbearably name-conscious. He began by regrouping his friends according to their ancestries, his infrequent parties were characterised by his almost parliamentarian system of seating. No doubt, all this had been in Thatcher Blit to begin with. It may well be, in perhaps varying quantities in all of us, but it grew with him, prospered with him. Yet in all those years he never once inspected his own four beers. You may well ask, was he afraid? One answers, one does not know. But at any rate, the fact remains that Thatcher Blit, at the age of 67, was one of the few rich men in the world who did not know who, who exactly their ancestors had been. And so at last we come to the day when Thatcher Blit was sitting alone in his office, one languid hand draped vacantly over his brow, listening with deep satisfaction to the hum and click of the enormous operations which were going on in the building around him. What moved him that day remains uncertain. Perhaps it was that, from where he was sitting, he could see row upon row of action pictures of famous men which had been taken from his time scanners. Or perhaps it was simply that his profound question had been gnawing at him all these years, deeper and deeper, and on this day broke out into the light. But whatever the reason, at 11.02 that morning, he leaped vitally from his chair. He summoned Cathcart, his chief assistant, and gave him the immortal command. Cathcart, he grated, stung to the core of his being. Who am I? Cathcart rushed off to find out. There followed some of the most taught and fateful days in the brilliant history of genealogy incorporated. Father tracing is, of course, a painstaking business. It was not long before word had begun to filter out to interested people. The first interesting discovery made was a man called Blot in 18th century England. No explanation was ever given for the name's alteration from Blot to Blit. Certain snide individuals took this to mean that the name had been changed as a means to avoid prosecution or some such, 
and immediately began making light remarks about the blots on old Blitz escutcheon. This blot had the distinction of having been wine seller of considerable funds. This reputedly did not sit well with Thatcher Blit. Merchants, he snapped, however successful, are not worthy of note. He wanted empire buildings. He wanted, at the very least, a name he had heard about, a name that appeared in the histories. His workers furiously scanned back into the past. Months went by before the next name appeared. In ninth century England there was a wandering minstrel named John, last name unprintable, who achieved considerable notoriety as a ballad singer before dying an unnatural death in the boudoir of a lady of high fashion. Although the details of this man's life were of extreme interest, they did not impress the old man. He was, on the contrary, rather shaken, a minstrel and a rogue to boot. There were shake-ups in genealogy incorporated. Cathcart was replaced by a man named Jukes, a highly competent man despite his interesting family name. Jukes forged ahead full steam past the birth of Christ, no relation, but he was well into ancient Egypt before the search began to take on the nature of a crisis. Up until then, there was simply nobody, or to be more precise, nobody but nobodies. It was incredible. All the laws of chance were against it, but there was, actually, not a single ancestor of note, and no way of faking one, for that Shablit couldn't be fooled by his own methods. What there was, was simply an unending line of peasants, serfs, an occasional foot soldier or leather worker. Past John the ballad singer, there was no one at all worth reporting to the old man. This situation would, could not continue, of course. There were so few families for men to spring from. The entire Gallic nation, for example, a great section of present-day France, sprang from the family of one lone man in the north of France in the days before Christ. Every native Frenchman, therefore, was at least the son of a king. It was impossible for Thatcher Blit to be less so the hunt went on from day to day, past ancient Greece, past Jarmo, past the wheel and metals and farming, and on even past all civilization, outward and backward into the cold primordial wastes of northern Germany. And still there was nothing. Though Jukes lived in daily fear of losing his job, there was nothing to do but press on. In Germany, he reduced Blitzed ancestor to a slovenly little man who was one of only three men in the entire tribe or family, one of three in an area which now contains millions. But Blitz ancestor, true to form, was simply a member of the tribe, as was his father before him. Yet onward it went, westward back into the French caves, southward into Spain and across the unrecognisable Mediterranean into a verdant North Africa backward in time past even the Cro-Magnons, and yet ever backward, thirty thousand years, thirty-five thousand, with old Blit reduced now practically to gibbering and still never an exceptional forebear. There came a time when Jukes had at last, inevitably, to face the old man. He had scanned back as far as he could, the latest ancestor he had unearthed for Blit was a hairy creature who did not walk erect. And yet, even here, Blit refused to concede. It may be, he howled, it must be that my ancestor was the first man to walk erect or light a fire, to do something. It was not until Jukes pointed out that all those things had been already examined and found hopeless that Blit finally gave in. Blit was a relative, of course, of the first man to stand erect, the man with the first human brain, but so was everybody else on the face of the earth. There was truly nowhere else to explore. What would be found now would be only the common history of mankind. Blit retired to his chambers and refused to be seen. 
The story went the rounds, as such stories will, and it was then at last, after 40,000 years of insignificance, that the name of Blit found everlasting distinction. The story was picked up, fully documented, by psychologists and geneticists of the time, and inserted into textbooks as a profound commentary on the forces of heredity. The name of Thatcher Blit in particular has become famous, has persisted until this day, for he is the only man yet discovered, or ever likely to be discovered, with this particular distinction. In 40,000 years of scanner-recorded history, the bloodline of Blit, or Blot, never once produced an exceptional man. The record is unsurpassed. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Firth's World by Irving Cox Jr. Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction, May 1955. Narrated by Tom Trusser. His world was utopia inhabited only by wealthy, brilliant, creative, ambitious people. It was the ultimate in freedom, exempt from taxes, social problems, petty responsibilities. Let him go. It's quite safe to leave us. I want to talk to him. Sit over there, Chris, where you can be comfortable. A paradox, isn't it? You were taught we may never go back. Now I've authorised the building of the rocket. From your point of view, you were justified in trying to destroy it. I'm violating the regulations. You weren't. But time changes the shape of the truth, Chris. It isn't static. No one had the insight, then, to grasp the insanity of John Firth's dream. People hated Firth or envied him, but no one called him mad. John Firth was an industrialist, yet far more than that too. Politician, scientist, financier, even an artist of sorts. There was nothing he couldn't do, and few things he didn't do superbly well. That accounts for his philosophy. He never understood his own superiority. He honestly believed that all men could achieve what he had, if they had set their minds to it. Lazy, incompetent fools, he would say. The world's full of them, and they elected a government of fools, taxing me to support the others. As billionaires go, John Firth was very young. Six months after world government became an established reality, earthships began to explore the skies, and in less than a year, Mars, Venus, and the Earth had formed a planetary confederacy. A new feeling came to men when the burden of warfare was lifted from their minds. Men were free, free for the first time in centuries. Their full energies were channeled into invention, exploration, experiment. The Earth was like a frontier town, booming, uproarious, lusty, dynamic, but with a social conscience Poverty and deprivation for none, an unlimited opportunity for all. For man, that abstract symbol of mass humanity, it was the best of all possible worlds. Yet there were misfits. John Firth was one of them. We're coddling people, he said. We're teaching them to live on charity, on government handouts, and I'm expected to pay for it all. Cut them loose, let them sink or swim for themselves. If some of them don't survive... Well, they won't, that's all. We'll be a stronger people if we would rid ourselves of the leeches. He was a man of the new age, stubbornly holding to ideas from the old. And then the stranger came to see him. We don't know who the stranger was or where he came from. A force of evil, perhaps, the symbol of Satan refurbished and streamlined to fit the concepts of the modern world. I've been reading your political pamphlets, Mr. Firth the stranger said. You hold rather, rather fascinating views. Now that I'm suitably flattered, Firth answered, may I ask what particular form of handout you want? None. I've something for sale. The stranger took a pamphlet out of his pocket. But tell me this first. 
Do you honestly believe what you've written here? Every word of it. If I could find my sort of world anywhere in the universe, I'd pull up stakes in a minute and— You can create your own world, Mr. Firth. Do you suppose I haven't tried? In every election I back my candidates with all I have. Prestige, propaganda, money. It does no good. The fools prefer to be governed by other fools, like themselves. I didn't mean here, Mr. Firth. The stranger smiled as he lit a cigarette. You see, my friend, I have a world for sale. A brand new world. One of the asteroids? Firth laughed bitterly. I could have done that years ago. They're too close to the commercial orbits. How long would it be before one of our ships found the place? Then I'd be right back in the system again, and a laughing stock as well. This is a planetoid beyond Pluto. It'll be generations before any of our ships. A frozen world? No thanks. Only on the surface. It's a hollow sphere with a granite crust half a mile thick. Inside there's a suggestion of passageways and caverns, which may have been made artificially. Perhaps this was an outpost of a race which lived and died billions of years before our time. An archaeological gold mine! But science pays so little, Mr. Firth. I'm interested in cash, not prestige. Why should I pay you anything? You've told me where it is and what it is. I can find it for myself. The stranger laughed. I said beyond Pluto. That covers a lot of space, Mr. Firth. He paused for a moment. My price is the stock in your Martian mines. Convert the rest of your holdings into any form of wealth that seems convenient and usable. In your case, Mr. Firth, you can take it with you, to your own world. Think of it. No taxes, no social problems, no unfortunate masses to prey on your conscience, no government but your own. That was the beginning of the dream. The seed of the idea grew in John Firth's mind until it overshadowed everything else. It became an obsession, driving him so that he had no peace. During the course of a year, Firth and the stranger imported and installed the machinery to make the sphere livable. Hydroponic tanks, air machines, gravitators, electric generators, and an atomic power core. In the crust of the planetoid, they found enough fissionable material to keep Firth's world running for an eternity. They laid out the decorative landscaping, planned the living quarters, the laboratories, the amusement hall, and the university. It is interesting to speculate how much the stranger contributed to the scheme, and it is an ironic speculation, for as soon as the larger idea took shape in Firth's mind, his only logical course was to murder the stranger. Firth could allow no outsider to know of the planetoid. To him it had become far more than a means of personal escape. It was to be an archive for the survival of John Firth's ideas, for the survival of civilization itself. John Firth believed that sincerely. Firth's world, that magnificent dream which was like a holy crusade, was founded on murder, deception and greed. The reasoning of fanaticism engenders its own kind of ruthlessness. As soon as John Firth had disposed of the stranger, he began to select his colonists, men who by his definition were not fools. He had to make his choice very carefully. If he misjudged his candidate and his proposition was rejected, Firth had given away his secret. Any man who refused him had to die. Murder was Firth's only guarantee of silence. But he made few mistakes. John Firth was a good judge of men, his kind of men. All of them were wealthy, ambitious, brilliant. Nearly three hundred men and women were recruited. They came here to escape. The record tells us that, until we gag of the repetition. But to escape what? Taxes they resented unanimously, and restrictions on their freedom. They placed a value on the ownership of property that we can no longer understand. But if you read the record closely, all that becomes superfluous. The thing they wanted to escape was responsibility. 
responsibility to their fellow men. Physically, Firth's world was a paradise, it still is, yet the dissolution began before the last colonist had arrived. Here they had assembled their wealth, in terms of machines, comforts, books, art treasures, amusements, laboratory equipment. They were entirely free from the burden of taxation. But somehow their wealth lost its meaning. They claimed they had not withdrawn from the world in order to hibernate and decay among their luxuries. They wanted freedom in order to create, to invent, to experiment as they pleased. And they had that in Firth's world, a maximum opportunity for the development of individual initiative. For a short time they turned out a wonderful assortment of new gadgets and new machines, but slowly their industry ground to a stop. If they had faced the truth then. But they were far too human to admit the failure of the dream. Instead, they found a scapegoat. John Firth has left us a record of the conversation he had with Adam Burtz. It is typical of their thinking at the time. Burtz, as you may know, was one of the outstanding physicists of his day. He had created and built Atomic Cores, Incorporated until it was the largest power company in the Confederation. John Firth met Burtz one morning on the golf course in the recreation cabin. Adam, Firth cried with his usual boisterous good humour, I never thought I'd find you out here at this time of day. Why not? the physicist shrugged. I'm tired, Firth. I had to do my four-hour shift in the light plant last night. Maybe I'll feel like working in the lab tomorrow, and maybe not. I'm scheduled for a shift in hydroponics, then. The shifts are short, Adam, and... Still too long for me. I'm not used to so much physical labour. The physicist's lips curled in a sneer. So very democratic, isn't it, Firth? Back home I hired men to do that kind of work for me. Firth clapped him heartily on the back. But we have other compensations, Adam. Four hours out of twenty-four is a small price to pay for freedom. Twenty-eight hours a week. Remember the new labour law the Earth government put into effect before we left. It proscribed a maximum work week of twenty-five hours for every man. We came here to escape restrictions, but we've saddled ourselves with more hours of manual labour than the least skilled labourer has to do on Earth, Firth. I'm not a manual labourer, neither is anyone else you brought here. Do you want to go back? What answer can I make to that? We're executives, Firth, but here we're a brain without a body. We can formulate the orders, but with neither arms nor legs to carry them out. In other words, you're saying we should import a labour force to do our basic work for us? Why not? They're the fools, Adam. The incompetence. On earth they were the millstones around our necks, envying us, hating us, building a prison for us with their laws and their regulations. All very true, Adam, where the government is in their hands. But we could keep them under control. After that, John Firth heard the same complaint from the others, over and over. They said they could not take advantage of their freedom because of the chores they had to do to keep Firth's world functioning. Firth called a meeting of the colonists. It was the closest approximation to a government they had. Government itself was one of the things they wanted to escape. They unanimously agreed that a labour force had to be recruited, and they settled upon 150 as the necessary number, half of them to be women. Working eight hours a day, such a force could perform the work of Firth's world, yet the colonists would outnumber them two to one, and the labour force would not be large enough to constitute a threat. We'll insist that they marry, of course, Adam Burtz said, and each couple will provide us with two children so that we shall always have a stabilised labour supply. We're talking, one of the women whispered, as if we're buying cattle. We are. But how can you recruit men and women under these conditions? What inducement can you possibly offer them? Firth smiled. When we find the people who meet our specifications, they'll come, don't worry. 
In the days of the sailing ships, the technique was called shanghaiing. What specifications, Mr. Firth? They must be young, strong, healthy, single, and low-level morons, Adam Burtz cut in. Imbeciles won't give us any trouble later on. To his other crimes, John Firth then added kidnapping. The end justified the means. He was creating a world, and that world would save civilization. I doubt that his conscience ever troubled him. Within two years, the second group of colonists was established in Firth's world. Apparently, they made an easy adjustment to their new environment. We have no record of complaints or protests. They were docile, obedient people. They took orders well. They liked to be told what to do. They needed very little supervision. The first colonists were entirely free, then, of any sort of work responsibility. For a while they went back to work in their laboratories or in the university, inventing, exploring, accumulating their store of knowledge. In imperceptible stages, however, their interest lagged. Their production came to a halt again. This time they had no excuse, no scapegoat. We can assume that some of them faced the truth squarely and honestly, yet they had chosen Firth's world and there was no way to turn back. We find only one actual hint of their despondency in a diary page written by an unknown woman. Carl stayed home again today. He had nearly finished the design for his machine, but he has no more enthusiasm to complete it. I know how he feels. I can't go on with my painting either. We have no purpose, no goal to achieve. We sit isolated in space, counting over the wealth of our talent and ability, but we can make no use of it. I wish I knew how many of the others think as I do, but I'm afraid to ask. The key to understanding them is that last sentence. Perhaps they all felt a disillusionment, but they had to pretend. Firth's world couldn't be at fault. If they were dissatisfied, it was because of a failure within themselves. At all costs, the floor had to be hidden from their neighbours. Their first labour trouble was a welcome interlude in the creeping boredom. The docile labour battalion suddenly discovered they were being overworked. Just what they could have done in Firth's world with shorter hours, no one knows. They staged a spotty, amateurish strike. Speakers made reference to the labour laws applicable on the earth and demanded better pay. To what end, it's hard for us to say. If the first colonists had turned over all their wealth, the workers would have had no more use for it. John Firth was unusually alarmed by the threatened strike. He reacted with excessive violence, and the other colonists followed his lead. Three of the leaders of the uprising were executed. Others were brutally whipped. The outlaw pit was built then. Thereafter, at the first hint of any dissatisfaction, workers were condemned to it. The violence taught the workers resentment. Silently, sullenly, they passed on their hatred to their children. The aristocracy created the revolution and nurtured it, for it would have made no real difference if they had surrendered entirely to the strikers' demand. The children of the first colonists made no pretense of using Firth's world to advance knowledge, invention or art. They were hedonists, bred to luxury, supported by slaves. The slaves, for their part, felt no emotion but hatred. From their parents they learnt that the aristocracy had violated the labour law. The children knew nothing about the law or the distant earth where it applied, but it was held in deep and sacred reverence. The laboratories and the university stood empty. Only the recreation cavern held any interest for the new aristocracy. A change took place among the slaves too. Their parents had been hand-picked morons. But neither brilliant achievement nor the moronic mind is hereditary. Most of the workers' children had an average intelligence. One or two would have been classified as geniuses. To their hatred, the second generation joined intelligence, and Firth's world was ready to blow apart. They struck the light plant first. 
sudden and unexpected violence surged through the dark stone-walled corridors. John Firth led a band of men against the enemy, but his attack failed and the workers seized the atomic power core, the heart of our world. If they shut down the reactors, they would stifle not only our lights, but the gravitators and the air machines as well. They would kill us all. The workers knew that. They were willing to risk suicide. Every bargain encounter was on their side. It was John Firth who surrenders. Firth's world died then. In the bitter depths of the pit, John Firth remembered what Adam Burtz had said to him so many years before. We have come a brain without a body. We can formulate the orders, but with neither arms nor legs to carry them out. Suddenly, John Firth understood the fallacy of his fanaticism. A society was like a living body, an integrated organism of many members. No one could function without the others. No man, no group of men, could create an isolated world. The social equation seemed as clear to Firth as the simplest sum in arithmetic. Each man was a part of a functioning social unit which included them all. Each man's talent, whether it was the plodding docility of a moron or the brilliance of genius, belonged to all men. In the meantime, the workers found that they could not run Firth's world alone either. They gloried in forbidden luxuries until they were satiated. Shortly, they became as indolent as the aristocracy had been, and the food supply was nearly exhausted. The treaty they made was direct and to the point. The two groups agreed to live in equality, sharing the burden of the labour and the accumulated wealth of knowledge. The treaty was made when you were a child. We have perfected the technique of cooperation within one generation. We're ready now to go back to Earth. You'll be with us? Fine, Chris. No, please, no apologies. I understand why you intended to destroy our ship. Others have attempted it too. No harm was done. You're free. Entirely free. The organiser waited until he was alone in the office. Then, with trembling, ageing hands, he took the logbook out of the safe and slowly made another entry. Chris was the last, I think. He accepted the lie, just as most of the others have. When they return to Earth, there will be sound men with whole minds. For them... Firth's world will always stand as a symbol of man's highest achievement in cooperation. May this sham, in some small way, expiate the crime and the folly of my arrogant delusion. John Firth's head dropped on his arm and his shoulders shook, but the sobs were sobs of relief. Chris was saved. Chris would go back. That mattered very much, for Chris was his grandson. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Show Must Go On By Henry Slezar Originally published in Infinity, July 1957 Narrated by Tom Trissel he awoke in darkness, trembling with the thought of escape. His hands groped around the floor, trying its solidity. Then he crawled forward with agonizing slowness until his fingertips found a wall. He raised himself to his feet, his cheek scraping at the cool surface of the enclosure. An idea came to him, and he slapped at the pocket of his shirt. His palm struck the outline of something. Matches! He lit one and raised it to the level of his wide, frightened eyes. He was facing a door, a barricade of steel, without sign of latch or doorknob. But there was a sign, and he read it in the flicker of the match flame. It said, Push. He made a noise in his throat and shoved against the door. It gave in to his weight, and he was outside the building, standing in a courtyard washed softly by moonlight. He circled where he stood, 
and knew he was a prisoner still. A wire fence, four times his height, surrounded him. He came closer to it, and plunged his fingers through the mesh, rattling it helplessly in his misery. Then he saw the second sign, and held his breath. It read, "'You can do it!' Encouraged, he began his climb. The toes of his rubber-soled shoes fit neatly into the openings, and he gained the summit of the fence quickly. He swayed uncertainly at the top, and almost dropped the twenty-five feet to the other side. But he regained his balance, clambered down the mesh, and dropped panting to the ground. A voice boomed at him. "'All right, let's go. We haven't got all night.' He forced himself to his feet, and looked for the source of the sound with wild movements of his head. He could see nothing but the menacing shadows of a crowded forest. With a frightened glance over his shoulder, he plunged into the thick of it, hoping to find a pathway to the unknown freedom he sought. He thrashed through the tangled vines for a small eternity, and then gave up with a sob. He fell against a tree trunk, dampening the bark with his tears. This time the voice was quieter, but its tone was impatient. "'Keep going, keep going, to the right, the right!' He clung to the tree as if for protection, and then, with a gasp, plunged once more into the darkness. He found the clearing to the right. It was like an arena, with spectator trees, and with bright eyes winking at him through the leaves. There was a log to the left of the cleared green circle, and a frail young girl in torn clothing sat on it, huddled with either fear or cold. She was clutching something like an infant to her chest. He came closer, and saw that it was a broadsword. He paused. "'Who are you?' he said. She looked up at him, her expression savage. "'You're here!' she said. He took a step forward, and the voice spoke once more. "'Kill her, and you go free!' "'No!' he shouted. "'Kill him, and go free!' said the voice. The girl put her head in her arms. Her shoulders shook. He walked towards her, and she screamed. "'No, please!' he said painfully. "'I won't hurt you. Why should I hurt you?' She looked at him narrowly. Her hand tightened around the handle of the sword. "'You know why,' she accused. "'You must trust me,' he said. He put his hand out gently to her. She backed away from his touch and leaped off the log. She moved away cautiously, gripping the weapon with both hands. "'Use the sword,' said the voice. "'Strike and go free!' She trembled and lifted the sword from the ground. The man whirled, eyes penetrating the forest for an escape route. He backed up, and fell over a trailing root. "'Now!' said the voice. "'Strike!' The girl moved toward him, hypnotically. "'I hate you! I hate you!' she moaned. She lifted the blade high, and the man lashed out with his foot as he towered over him. The broadsword flew from her grasp. "'Now kill her!' said the voice. "'And you can go free!' "'I won't!' he shouted again. He scrambled to his feet and made a dive for the weapon. He took it in his hand and waved it threateningly at the surrounding woods. "'Come out! Come out!' he screamed. The eyes of the forest blinked back at him in silence. He flung the sword from his hand as if in loathing. Then he crashed into the forest once more. The producer gurgled through his hookomatic. Frick, his assistant, recognised this symptom of official disgust, and jumped to his feet. "'Turn it off,' the producer said, gesturing toward the Fidelivision screen. Frick turned it off. "'No, leave it on,' the producer moaned, peeping at the white oblong through his chubby fingers. "'Let's see what Manford does in this pickle.' Frick turned it on. "'He'll probably drop in the dinosaur film,' he said. "'If he does, I get a new director,' the producer answered in a rumbling voice. "'He's used that spot three times in the past month.' The Fidelivision flashed. A screaming red title dripped bloodily across the screen. "'Man Against Dinosaur,' it said. 
that Reduces' angry cry almost drowned out the horrific roar of the live prop brontosaurus that appeared. "'Meeting! Meeting!' he cried. "'We're going to have a staff meeting right after the show!' "'A live meeting?' Frick gasped. "'A live one,' the producer said. "'Everybody here! Right here! In person! This is an emergency!' "'Gosh, Tiddy!' Frick frowned disapprovingly. "'That's kind of rough, isn't it? I mean, a phone-screen session would be a lot simpler. It'll take hours for Manford and the rest of them to get through the jam!' "'I don't care,' the producer said petulantly. "'This kind of bumbling inefficiency has gone far enough. It'll do him good to get crushed in the traffic for a change.' Frick paled, obviously disturbed by the severity of the punishment the producer was meeting out. Only the lowest ranks of employees, the non-executives, the factory people, were forced to suffer the indignities of the jam. "'I'm sure they'll get that fellow,' Frick said. "'After all, T.D., how far can he get? When he gets out of the forest, he'll reach the studio barrier, and he'll be stopped. Simple as that.' "'And what if he finds the exit?' Frick scoffed. "'Well, the odds on that—' "'Odds! Don't talk to me about odds, Frick!' The producer winced as man and brontosaurus came together on the screen. There was a close-up of the man's face, and his expression wasn't pretty when he saw the imitation beast. But, of course, he couldn't know it was harmless. "'The letters!' the producer groaned. "'The complaints! I can see him now!' The office door opened. A pretty redhead with vacant eyes and a frozen smile poked a head inside. "'What is it, Miss Stitch?' "'Will you take a call from Mr. Manford? Phone screen seven. "'You bet I will.' the producer said menacingly. Frick lowered the Findelivision sound and flicked on PS7 with a few efficient motions. The face of Joe Manford, the director of the night's thrill show, was haggard despite the jovial smile. Uh, "'Hi, Tiddy,' he said. "'Been watching the show?' "'Yes, Joseph,' the producer said gravely. "'Oh,' the smile faded, but only for a moment— "'Well, nothing to worry about. Our boys will have that fellow rounded up in a few minutes. Can't imagine how that got fouled up. But that's the thrill show for you, full of surprises.' "'Is that a fact?' said the producer. He picked up the butt of his hook matic and sipped smoke calmly. "'I presume this fellow was fully authorised before you put him on.' "'Oh, yes,' Manford said hastily. He passed the routine FCC physical and had the usual adrenaline and hypnomechalil dose. I mean, you saw the girl, didn't you? She was fine, wasn't she? He beamed. Yes, said the producer. She certainly was fine. Freak stirred uncomfortably behind him. Anyway, the director continued, we're dropping in the dinosaur film. That's always good for a few shivers, and we've sent a crew into the studio to get that man out of there. The producer nodded his head toward his assistant. "'Frick,' he said, eyes on Manford. "'You tell him.' Frick stepped into range. He cleared his throat and looked at the floor. "'There'll be a meeting after the show,' he mumbled. "'Meeting?' Manford said. "'What for?' He blinked and looked at Frick's bowed head. Then he looked dazed. "'You don't mean a, a live meeting?' Frick nodded. The producer puffed contentedly on his hook matic He blew a smoke ring, and it puffed itself to pieces against the phone screen. The man raised himself from the ground. His limbs felt weak, and he had to force the breaths through his lungs. He got to his feet, feeling somewhat stronger. The forest seemed as impenetrable as ever, but he faced its challenge now with more confidence. That girl, he thought, my God, she was really going to kill him. He shook his head bewilderedly. Such a young, pretty girl. What had he done to her? What made her want to do it? He moved through the forest slowly, ducking branches, trailing the sources of dim lights in the distance. But as he approached, they proved to be illusory, odd reflections of moonlight among the trees. She didn't want to kill him. Not really. He could sense that. It was something more. 
She was compelled to do it. That was it. Someone had put her up to it. But who? Who hated him enough? The speculation made his head ache. He blanked out his thoughts and decided to concentrate on his predicament. There had to be a way out. The girl had entered the forest at some point. But where? He heard the sound of voices, and he stopped breathing. Manford means business, one of them said. He's plenty worried. T.D. was watching tonight. The sponsors kick T.D., T.D. kicks Manford, and Manford kicks us. Who do we kick? I don't know about you. I got an old dog home. OK, let's separate and find this bird. Right. Hey, Lou, let's have some tracer lights. He concealed himself in the brush as a burst of light exploded over the treetops. He watched the men parade past, ordinary-looking men, executive types with white collars and knit ties and flannel suits. Strangely enough, they seemed quite at home in this wilderness. He waited until they passed his hiding place, then he started on a nimble run in the direction from which they had come. The producer fitted himself snugly into executive position, desk, swivel chair, and man welded into one solid, efficient unit. He sighed a comfortable sigh and glanced up at the wall clock. Ten thirty. The thrill show would be over in half an hour. The dinosaur film would wind it up neatly. He'd probably have some explaining to do to the sponsors tomorrow, but he was all prepared to give the usual popular demand argument. He regretted the live meeting he had called. It would be two hours at least before the staff ploughed through the traffic jam. That meant he couldn't leave the office until after one thirty. He looked at the hopeless tower of papers on his desk blotter. Most of them were letters, and his secretary had never quite gotten the hang of weeding out the chaff. Once he found a letter from an FPC vice-president in the discard file. Since then he ordered all mail to his desk. He wished he could get a better secretary than Miss Stitch, but the shortage of A1-rated secretaries, A for attractiveness, 1 for efficiency, was acute. He skimmed through the top of the pile quickly. Dear Mr. Donnelly, certainly enjoyed Death in the Ring, one of the best thrill shows I've ever seen. Wonder if you would consider a football thriller I have in mind called Murder Kicks Off. Dear Mr. Donnelly, let's have more shows like Snake Pit. That mother and baby idea was the greatest. I really thought that woman would go nuts when she saw her kid with the cobra. A shocker all the way. Dear Mr. Donnelly, if Kiss of Death was your idea of entertainment, you ought to retire. Sort of sex schmaltz went out with television. Give us real gutsy stuff and never mind the mush. I'm only eleven years old, but I'll bet I could write a better scenario than that. I have this idea for a show called— Dear Mr. Donnelly, the producer sighed again. He reached into his pill drawer and took an ulcer capsule. Then he went back to his correspondence. When the man entered his office, he didn't even glance up. That you, Frick, he said, eyes on a letter of praise from a Yonkers housewife. When the man didn't answer, the producer looked up. He gasped. Hey! he said. Shut up! the man said harshly. He moved swiftly towards the desk and lifted a bronze ashtray in a lightning motion. He raised the object threateningly over the fat man's head. Keep quiet! he said. What is this? the producer's voice quavered. Then he recognized the face. You're the one from the show! The man blinked. His face relaxed, and he lowered the impromptu weapon. I—I'm sorry. The producer came around the side of the desk. He took the ashtray from his hand and helped him into the interview chair. The man collapsed limply at his touch. How do you get here? the producer said. I don't know, the man mumbled. I found a door. Back there. He buried his chin on his chest. His clothes were shredded, and his hands were trembling. "'Just take it easy,' the producer told him. He stabbed his finger on a desk button. The signal brought Frick into the office. 
"'What's up, did he?' Then the assistant saw the man in the chair. "'My God!' he whispered, swallowing hard. "'Gosh, I'm terribly sorry, T.D.' "'Never mind being sorry,' the producer said gratingly. "'Let's just be thankful he found his way here instead of into the street, if he'd been picked up by the police.' The assistant mopped his brow. "'That would have been terrible. They'd surely recognise him from the show. If the FCC saw him in this condition—' "'Yes,' the producer said grimly. "'If they saw him in this condition, the medical office would slap an injunction on us so fast. We'd all be out in the jam. Do you realise that?' Frick blanched. "'I'll get Dr. Stark in here right away. We'll get him an anti-dope shot immediately.' "'That girl,' the man said. "'It's okay, fella,' Frick said. "'You're okay now.' "'Never mind him,' said the producer. "'Get Speer in here, right away.' Frick hurried out. The producer poured a slug of brandy into a cup and held it to the man's lips. He gulped it gratefully, and then exploded a rasping cough. When the cough subsided, he buried his head on his chest again, breathing heavily. The producer studied the man's face. It was oddly familiar. "'Say,' he said. He put his hand under the chin and lifted the face up. The eyes opened. "'Aren't you Jerry Spicer?' The man stared blankly. The producer grunted. "'Huh. Guess you don't know who you are right now, fella. But you're Jerry Spicer, all right. Imagine that!' Teedy shook his head. The great Spicer in a thrill show, he chuckled dryly. The doctor bustled into the office, a small cyclone trailing the nervous assistant behind him like a flurrying dust cloud. Roll up his sleeve, he told the producer commandingly. He removed the hypodermic spray gun from his bag and carefully filled it with a dozen cc's of the anti-dope. He dabbed the man's arm with a shred of cotton and pressed the spray against his flesh. "'Good thing I hung around tonight,' the doctor grumbled. "'If this man ever got away in this condition—' "'We know, we know,' the producer said testily. "'Fix him up and cut the chatter.' "'I saw that show,' the doctor said. "'Somebody sure fouled up. Probably gave him an overdose.' "'We'll get to that later,' the producer promised. "'Just do your job, Doc.' "'I'm through,' Stark said crisply. "'Put him on that couch over there and raise his legs.' He'll come to his senses in about ten minutes, I hope. Frick and the producer helped the man to the sofa. He sprawled on it full length, fingers trailing on the carpet. Do you know who he is? T.D. said. He's Jerry Spicer. Who? Spicer, the big TV star, you remember. The doctor halted in the process of clasping his bag and came over to the sofa. He looked at the man's relaxed face. "'By God!' he said. "'You're right. Now what the hell is Spicer doing on a thrill show?' The producer shrugged. "'I don't know. I haven't heard anything about him for the past eight or ten years.' "'He must have had it tough,' Frick said musingly. "'I mean, a big star like that on a programme like this.' "'What do you mean, a programme like this?' the producer looked displeased. If the staff had a nickel's worth of imagination, they would have played this up big. Gosh, said Frick, that's true. We could have used a credit card. I bet he wouldn't have permitted it, the doctor said. You know what Spicer thought of the thrill show. Yeah, the producer's face reddened. Well, we proved how wrong it was, didn't we? The public was just sick and tired of that namby-pamby stuff. There had to be a thrill show. Sponsored demanded it. Frick said loyally. And besides, T.D. added, if he doesn't like us, what the hell did he sign up for? The doctor pursed his lips. Maybe he was hungry. Frick said, he's still not coming round, Doc. He'd better, Stark said warningly. If the antidote doesn't work, it could mean a lot of trouble for the thrill show, Mr. Donnelly. The producer looked frightened. That's ridiculous. It's got to work. It always worked. You better call your staff, the doctor said. Find out what dosage they gave this man. Check his FCC medical authorization, And do it fast, Mr. Donnelly. This is just the kind of thing the FCC can hang you on. Thank God I called that meeting, 
the producer said. "'Here's the straight poop!' Manford, the thrill-show director, looked briskly around the room. They had gathered around the table in the conference room, the staff members still hollow-cheeked and shaken by their experience in the jam. "'This fellow came into the office last week and signed up for a spot in the thrill show. We needed somebody for the Battle of the Sexes show, and he was a pretty nice-looking guy. A little seedy, maybe, but all right. He gave his right name. Here's his record. But nobody on the interviewing staff recognised him. Guess they're all a little too young to remember Jerry Spicer very well.' "'All right,' the producer prodded. "'So what happened?' "'Well, just the routine things. "'The FCC medical officer gave him the standard physical. "'His psych check wasn't the best we've ever had, "'but that's always a debatable business. "'When he showed up for work yesterday, "'we gave him the regular dose of 10 cc's of adrenaline "'and 4 cc's of hypnomechalil. "'That's SOP for an anger-emotion show, of course.' "'The producer looked at Stark. "'Did you give him the shot?' "'No.' The doctor shuffled the papers in his hand. "'That new fellow, Grayson, do you want to see him?' "'He's gone home,' Manford said. "'It'll take an hour to get him here. Why not phone-screen him?' They took the director's suggestion. In a few minutes the image of Dr. Phil Grayson appeared on phone-screen four. He was a young man, with a high, balding forehead and a rabbity moustache. He looked worried when his home screen brought him the picture of the intense group around the conference table. "'What is it?' he said. "'Just checking back on some records, Doctor,' T.D. said smoothly. "'Remember the man you injected today, this fellow Spicer, for the Battle of the Sexes show?' The Doctor nodded. "'Of course. Was there anything unusual about the dosage?' Grayson looked puzzled. "'Naturally not. I gave him the prescribed dosage, just like Dr. Start told me. Ten cc's of noradrenaline, forty-four cc's of that—what did you call it? Hypnomechalil. Why?' Dr. Stark paled. "'I told you that,' he said. The colour rushed back into his cheeks a bright crimson. "'I told you adrenaline, you fool! Not noradrenaline! And four cc's of hypnomechalil!' He looked wildly at the man around the table. "'I swear I told him,' he said. "'You didn't,' the young doctor gasped. "'You told me forty-four. Stark jumped to his feet, his face livid. He started towards the phone-screen as if to throttle the two-dimensional image on the glass. "'You're a liar!' he cried. "'You knew it was an angry motion show. You knew what was required.' "'I didn't know,' Grayson answered, his moustache twinting. "'You didn't tell me that. I just assumed—' "'You assumed!' the producer stood up, looking thunderclouds at Dr. Stark. "'You knew what kind of show it was, Stark. Why didn't you tell him? We needed an anger reaction, not fear. That's what loused up the whole show!' Manford groaned. "'What does that matter now? Forty-four cc's of hypnomechalil. What kind of a doctor are you, Grayson? Don't you know you could kill a man that way?' "'I—I I didn't know. I never worked with these mechalil drugs. I studied antibiotics.' "'Better if it had killed him,' the producer said darkly. "'We might have covered that up. "'But we can never get him past the FCC examining officer now.' "'I swear he told me forty-four. I swear it.' Dr. Stark made a rush at the phone-screen. Grayson backed away in terror, despite the many miles that were between him and Stark's intended violence. With a snarl, the older doctor reached up and turned off the instrument. "'Now we're in for it,' he told the others. "'Maybe he'll be all right,' Manford said. "'Maybe he'll snap out of it. A little more antidote—' "'Nonsense,' Stark snapped. "'If it hasn't worked by now, it'll never work. The overdose has permanently affected his nervous system. He's an amnesiac for good, an amnesiac with a permanent case of the jitters.' Frick shivered. "'God, what a fate!' The producer looked wise. Yes, he said solemnly. He'd be better off dead, wouldn't he? The staff stared at him. You know what I'm talking about, T.D. said. He'd be better off dead. Better for him, for the thrill show, for us. Well, Manford said feebly, 
Well, nothing. The producer's voice was harsh. Do you get the significance of all this? Do you know what happens when the FCC medical officer wants to recheck Spizer? An injunction. A court battle. Then Spizer goes on the stand as Exhibit A, and we lose. No more thrill show. He looked at their faces individually. No more jobs. Bankruptcy. Poverty. The jam. This time, the shiver was collective. We can't let that happen. Manford licked his lips. What about the sponsors? They got pulled, don't they? They need us, don't they? I mean, nothing else will give them the kind of ratings they get from the thrill show. Their hands will be tied, T.D. said. One slip is all the Federal boys have been waiting for, and with all that foreign criticism our State Department's been getting. They still buy our films abroad, another staff man said glumly. That won't matter, the producer sat down heavily and put the cold end of his hookomatic in his mouth. The thrill show is doomed. Let's face it. The group dropped their eyes to the table. Of course, the producer said quietly, there's one way out. They looked up at him, hopefully. Remember, Juan Esprenzo? He said. They stared at him. That was a troublesome situation, too. But we came out of that one, didn't we? They gaped silently. Juan Esprenzo was killed on the angry city thrill show of November 19th, 1985. It was purely an accident, of course. He wandered out of the guide paths in the studio and was struck by a falling prop. Nobody could have foreseen it, and nobody could have prevented it. His family received $50,000 in insurance. The FCC investigation described the incident as unfortunate, and there was a special Juan Esprenzo memorial show held on January 3rd. But these things happen, just as they once did in boxing, football, racing. Nothing unusual, nothing to ban a programme about. They turned their eyes to the outer room where Jerry Spizer lay in a coma on the studio sofa. Do you get what I mean? the producer said. Don't you think we could pass another investigation a la Esbrenzo better than we could pass the one we're facing right now? They looked hopeful and frightened in turn. You mean deliberately kill him, Dee Dee? Cause an accident? Kill him right on the programme? Exactly the producer said with a satisfied smile. Put him on again tomorrow night. Make it a set-up. Have something go wrong. Then keep the cameras trained on him while we rush out of the studio control room to find out if he's all right. The whole country will see it was an accident. Only an accident. He turned to Wilson, the head scriptwriter. Wilson, he said, You've got an assignment. He awoke in darkness, trembling with the thought of escape. His hands groped around the floor, trying its solidity. When his fingertips found a wall, he raised himself with agonizing slowness, his nails scraping along the ridges in the damp stone. He pressed his hot cheek against the cool surface and sobbed pitifully. When his eyes adjusted to the feeble light, he measured the strength of his prison and felt the added terror of hopelessness. He turned his eyes to the pool of darkness in the centre of the dungeon and ventured forth a cautious foot. He had taken only three steps before he heard the voice. Look out! it said. Then he saw the pit. He looked with horror at the writhing beasts inside. He sank to his knees and stared in terrible fascination at their swaying bodies. Then he buried his face in his hands. He looked up when he heard the swish above him. Gleaming, swinging, evoking a memory in an impossibly distant past, it was a pendulum of razor-sharp steel. And it was descending. 
He screamed and lifted his arms above his head. The pendulum ground to a halt, the mechanism groaning and screeching in protest. There was a second of silence, and then the blade fell to earth with the suddenness of an avenging sword. This time the scream was cut off in his throat, and the giant weapon flattened him sickenedly against the edge of the precipice. Vaguely, as in a dream, he heard the sound of speech and running footsteps. "'My God, it broke! The pendulum broke! Somebody get the doctor! Look out for that pit! It's a forty-foot drop! Come on!' A hand touched his shoulder, and a ring of anxious faces floated like pink balloons over his head. "'I think he's still alive.' "'What?' "'He can't be. That thing tays a ton.' "'Well, he looks pretty bad, but I can see his eyes moving, and he seems to be... Get that blade off him!' He knew that the great weight had been removed from his body, but he could feel no difference. He was looking with almost objective interest into the face of a fat man, a familiar face with wide eyes and an open bow-lipped mouth. The face was covered with a film of nervous perspiration, and there was a strange sort of anxiety in the man's movements. "'He's got to be! He's got to be!' the fat man was whispering intently. "'But, T.D., shut up! When you lift him up, I want you to—' He heard nothing more, but his eyes remained open, fixing the face of the fat man. Then he felt arms around his shoulders once more, and he felt himself slipping, slipping back towards the edge. With a spurt of strength, with a flash of sudden intelligence, he raised his left arm, and the fingers caught the collar surrounding the fat man's necks in loose folds. He held on grimly until the fat man screamed with satisfying terror. "'Look out, Diddy!' somebody shrieked. "'He's dragging me with him!' the fat man flailed out helplessly. "'He's pulling me over the edge!' Somebody else leaped to his aid, but the dying man's grip was tenacious, his purpose certain. "'We're going over!' They did. The fat man and his victim. The cameras three, four, and five caught the action beautifully. Miss Stitch slipped her compact back into her purse and straightened the corners of the stack of mail on a desk blotter. She looked towards the empty office of the producer and smiled with secretive pleasure. Then she slit open the envelopes in front of her and leisurely read the morning mail. "'Dear Mr. Donnelly, boy, oh boy, what a thriller you gave us the other night! I thought Pit and the Pendulum was one of the best thrill shows yet. I sure was disappointed when I saw the title card and thought you were going to rehash that old Poe bit, but that new ending of yours really knocked me cold. I sure got a kick out of seeing that fat old guy going over the edge of the pit. What a terrific wind-up! I wonder if you would be interested in a really great story idea. You see, there's this crazy old guy who has a secret laboratory on a mountain top. Well, one night it's raining and lightning like mad, and this beautiful blonde comes along in a classy convertible. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Science fiction and fantasy and horror, oh my!